Um, to formally welcome us and get us started tonight, I'd like to invite the Northampton Mayor Narkowitz to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be with you tonight and to take part in this really special event. And obviously, I want to start off by thanking Cherry for her uh, leadership of the, um, of the wearing my hope pin here, my Hampshire hope pin, um, and the work that they've done in a short amount of time to um, to really pull together the resources in, in our community and in this region uh, to go after this problem of addiction that we are uh, struggling with, not only as a community, but as a region and as a nation. So um, I want to thank all the partners that are here tonight. I want to acknowledge a couple, a few elected officials that are here. Um, our district attorney, David Sullivan, is here. I want to acknowledge his presence. I want to acknowledge our sheriff, uh, Patrick Kaling, who's here in the back of the room. I also want to acknowledge one of my colleagues from city government, uh, city councilor Marianne Labarge is here. In the I also want to acknowledge um, uh, a couple of uh, members of our police department that are here who are um, also playing a key role. Obviously, one of the key partners in this effort is law enforcement. Um, and I'm proud to introduce um, Officer Van Buskirk, Adam Van Buskirk, and I think Officer <laughs> Buzzy was here. Uh, Officer Buzzy's in the back of the room. Um, thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, our police department uh, created a special uh, team, called, basically called a DART team, which is the Drug Addiction Response Team, which are a group of officers who've been specially trained to, um, to work on addiction issues and to work on tracking, uh, working with people who they've encountered to try to get them into, um, try to get them into recovery, uh, get them out of the justice system and get them into recovery, uh, because again, we want to focus on this as a public health crisis. So I want to thank uh, Chief Casper and the police department for their participation as well. <laughs> Most importantly, I want to thank the families who are here, um, the families of who, some of whom I've had a chance to speak with, um, I've had a chance to look at the, the wall that's, that's uh, forming in the other room, and. Um, to, to see some of the stories of, of um, uh, tragedy, some stories of hope, some stories of recovery. Um, this is, uh, this is you know, I've, I've been involved in public policy for 25 years working in government at different levels, and this is an issue that um, is unlike any other that I've encountered. Um, it, uh, it knows no, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate on class, it doesn't discriminate on race. It, it uh, attacks all sectors of our community. And so it's ever more important that we pull together as a community uh, to try to respond to it. So I'm really proud of the role that, uh, that the Hampshire um, Hope Coalition is playing, and I'm so thankful that you're all here tonight, and especially thankful um, we're gonna hear from some great speakers, but also our special guest, uh, former drug czar uh, Michael Botticelli, who's with us tonight. So thank you, thank you for being here. I uh, look forward to speaking with more of you, sharing more stories, and obviously, um, please check out some of the great resources that are here from the many partner organizations. Thank you. So before I bring up our next speakers, I just want to take a few moments to share with you about what Hampshire Hope is, what we do, and where we're headed. Um, so Hampshire Hope officially launched about two and a half years ago. We are funded through the City of Northampton's Health Department. We received a State Bureau of Substance Abuse Services grant. We are partnered with the towns of East Hampton, Amherst, Pelham, South Hadley, Belshire Town, and Ware. Those are our official town partners, but we are countywide, and we have plenty of other towns that are participating actively in the work that we do. And I just want to point out, in all fairness, Hampshire Hope might have started two and a half years ago, but there were people and there were agencies that have been actively and passionately working on this issue for many, many, many years. What makes Hampshire Hope important and what makes Hampshire Hope unique is that it is the web that is bringing us all together. 
It is helping us align our services, align our approaches so that we can address addiction across all of the sectors in our community, across community groups, and by engaging advocacy leaders in this region. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do and where we're going. So right now we are tackling three main issues. We're preventing first use and misuse of opioids and heroin among youth. Together we work with fantastic youth prevention coalitions. We work with the Spiffy Coalition, the East Hampton Healthy Youth Coalition, the Northampton Prevention Coalition, the South Hathaway Drug and Alcohol Co Coalition, the Quaybog Hills Substance Use Alliance, all of which strongly partner with our school districts. And through that work, we have been focusing on safe storage campaigns, on screening brief intervention and referral to treatment programs in the schools that our nurses are doing, and providing comprehensive education in the health classes that we know works. So that's what we've been working on in our schools and with our youth. We also um, have been hosting through our fantastic um, provider champion in our community, Dr. Ruth Poti, many, many physiology of addiction um, presentations at our local schools. Um, and they've been very well received. And they, these presentations are something that are helping our community understand addiction and hopefully um, tackle the stigma that um, we are facing here in our community. We're also striving to prevent overdose deaths. We've created significant partnerships with the district attorney's office, with our first responders, such as fire, EMS, and police officers, the Hampshire, the Hampshire County House of Corrections, emergency rooms, addiction treatment centers, family support and advocacy groups, you name it, tapestry. All these folks are at the table. We're here to reinforce and to improve access to Narcan, which we know is a life-saving tool. We want it in the hands of everyone. We want to be able to educate the public that calling 911 is vital, that we are here to help and not to hurt, and that saving a life is a chance at recovery. Thirdly, we are collaborating to discover where there are gaps in prevention, intervention, recovery, and in treatment. And our goal is to bridge these gaps to ensure that everyone has equal access to compassionate care. And I'm gonna speak a little bit more about that in a bit. So people who've never participated in a coalition might wonder what we do. What does it mean to get involved in Hampshire Hope? So I first wanna acknowledge that we are ever evolving. We change our approach with the issues that come up, the pressing issues, with the funding that's available, with new resources and with new ideas. But what I can tell you is that's most important is that we focus on building relationships and we develop relationships with one another and we develop relationships with agencies. So sometimes we might sit around a table and we map out a concern that we have in a community and we think about what possible solutions are and we bring folks to the table who we know need to be part of the solution. Sometimes we go to conferences together and we go out to dinner and we eat soul food and we sit around and we talk about what is the role that I play in this movement? How am I part of the solution? We develop personal connections, we build trust, and together with that trust, we are able to look at this issue at a much deeper level. As a large coalition, we also dedicate time to building the confidence and empowering individuals in various towns to step up and be leaders. We have seen people who are doing miraculous work in their individual communities, who are building their own little mini coalitions. Um, Belcher Town is a great example of that. I don't know, is, is Jill out here right now? I think she should raise her hand and be acknowledged if she is. Um, Jill is a community leader who is, who is fierce. And we need more fierce people like Jill out there addressing these unique needs in your community. Because these are the folks who have their hearts in it and know that we can do something about it and we should do something about this. And as a coalition, we also value our partnerships with regional coalitions. We work closely with Hamden County and Berkshire County and Franklin County. Um, we work with the Quaybog Hills Coalition because we know that county lines do not mean anything. They're arbitrary when it comes to addiction. We're looking for prevention opportunities and solutions in healthcare and criminal justice and behavioral health in schools, in our faith communities, in child welfare programs, in treatment programs, among public, public health agencies, 
and in community-based organizations, in all these really important parts of our community. So when you do visit the tables, ask our partners, what are you doing? How are you part of the solution? Because you will be inspired. So there are many steps that we need to take and we need to embark on together as a community to keep us moving forward. And I'm gonna think about three priorities tonight. Um, there are so many, but these are the three that I have on my mind. So first, like I said before, we really need to continue to bridge gaps in the services that we provide. This includes finding new and creative solutions to address barriers that exist with insurance companies, with harmful treatment policies, with um, the lack of appropriate transitions between various levels of care and through recovery. This is something that we are posed to do as a region, and we can take this on because lives are at stake right now. Secondly, we need to figure out how to expand our public health approach to address trauma and childhood adverse experiences, which many of you may have heard about in terms of ACEs. We must find ways to address deeper social issues like social isolation and detachment from family units and from our broader community. We know that this is connected to many of the concerns that we face. And thirdly, we need to more fully integrate harm reduction services into all the work that we do beyond Narcan. <clears throat> I, don't, <clears throat> I don't mean to diminish the role of Narcan. It is saving lives every day, and we have worked hard to gain acceptance and access to Narcan in our communities. The reality is, it is saving lives. But the reality is, people are still suffering and people are still dying. By truly embracing harm reduction, we shift a perception of prevention and intervention and treatment and addiction to something that is focused on our experiences as critical human rights issues. In Hampshire County and in this region, we can be a center for excellence of harm reduction. We have the people. We need to harness the energy that the Pioneer Valley has for social justice, and we need to move it into this movement. We have to show how all facets of our community would benefit from this approach, approach that is truly rooted in compassion. So I've been thinking a lot about how do you explain what harm reduction is to someone who's never heard about it? And I realized that we need to move beyond what harm reduction specifically is and start talking about what is the spirit of harm reduction? What does it truly mean? So I was racking my brain last night, how would I explain this? And um, unfortunately at 3 a.m. it came to me because that's when I think best. So I'm gonna reclaim a phrase, and this is a phrase that we see in this area all the time. Feminism, the radical notion that women are people. And here's my bumper sticker. Harm reduction, the radical notion that drug users are people. These are people who are deserving the same intensity of love and support, whether they are using or whether they are in treatment. Deserving of love when and if they relapse. Deserving of love even when it feels really hard to love the way that this disease is impacting their choices. I recently had the privilege to hear now former U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Murthy speak at a national conference that many of us went to in Atlanta. And he said, we need to reaffirm the belief that every life has value, that we don't leave anyone behind, that we do better when we believe that our destinies are linked. We have a sacred responsibility to care for one another. So here we are in this beautiful space with people who are filled with strength and talent and resiliency and kindness. And each one of us has something, no matter how small it is, that we can contribute in the healing process of our community. So thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for being part of this movement. So what I'd like
going to do is now bring up our speakers. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, bring up um, some folks from Florence Savings Bank and Cooley Dickinson Healthcare. So Cooley Dickinson has been an important partner in the work that we are doing with Hampshire Hope. And they've actually created their own internal task force to look at hospital and health and the, uh, the health systems to really look at opportunities to improve care. Recently, Florence Bank provided a significant financial contribution to Cooley Dickinson for these projects. So it is with my pleasure to introduce John Heaps, the president of Florence Bank, and Joanne Marcusi, the president and CEO of Cooley Dickinson Healthcare. Come on up. That was pretty powerful. I just said to Sherry, this, I knew this evening was gonna be special. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into this, the depot uh, here over the last 25 years. And as I walked in here, I could tell that something was very special. And um, just one of those evenings. And then to look at the, the wall of hope, and then to spend time with the people in the community that are here working and um, stopped at every table. What are you doing? How are you doing it? And um, it, you know, what I what I anticipated is exactly what I what I what I experienced. I ran into Omar, who is working with the uh, with the uh, sheriffs with the you know with the, at the county jail. Uh, what a story! You know, I, I thought he was working here. He's extremely well spoken, and uh, he says I'm an inmate. And I said, what, how did you get here? And, and he explained that he actually kind of volunteered to, to spend 18 months in, in, in the Correctional Institute. Institute. And um, he says he's been free for seven months. So it's a great story. I mean, it's just something that, that maybe we don't run into it at the bank as much as, as some of the community people, but boy, it certainly left an impression for me. Um, so that's my experience is here this evening and to hear what, what Sherry's doing is, is, just, is just fabulous. As far as what the, what the you know, why am I here? Well, the, we have a wonderful hospital um, and uh, Joanne and a group of people, doctors came up to our office uh, to talk about a program that they had been talking about for two years and had a task force to deal with the issues that we have in our community. And uh, it was pretty clear that this was a no-brainer for the bank to step up. Uh, we said that we would donate $50,000 to get this program going, to be a catalyst to get other uh, organizations, other, other uh, companies, businesses to step up. Because you know something? The mayor said it perfectly. This is a, this is a community issue. This isn't a, this isn't a police issue. It's not a DA issue. It's, it's all, all of our issues. It's a community, it's our people, it's our employees, and it's something that we have to deal with. So we, when we announced that we were going to help the hospital, uh, there was a uh, Facebook, which is a wonderful thing these days, when things are good. <laughs> and um, we posted it, and we got more responses. Monica uh, Karian, who's also on the board, is our marketing director, shared with me the, the, the responses. And the responses, we never got as many posts uh, the responses were, thank you, you're my bank, thank you so much. I mean, never in a million years do we think that we would get that kind of response. So we felt, you know, we felt good early on saying this is how we can help the hospital and what the, what the hospital is doing, but it also has helped so many, so many people in our community and we hope that, that this is just the beginning. And, you know, what everybody's here is saying tonight is we're in crisis. We have got to, we've got to step up and we've got to help and sometimes it's, the people you know, on the front line, and sometimes it's the organizations that have to step up and financially support what you guys are doing. So it was, it was a no-brainer for us. Uh, we want to stay involved. And Sherry, what I'd like to do is, with Monica here, is when you, when you take the wall and you put, we would like to help you fund that. So when you turn that in, we're gonna pay for that. So. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joanne. Thank you. My wire is here. Um, I just want to again thank Sherry. That was unbelievably inspirational. So I have not heard you speak before. It was amazing. So thank you. So as been stated, just over a year ago, we formally launched the Cooley Dickinson Opioid Task Force. We made that decision based on community need. 
As you know, Hampshire County, County was experiencing about 25 overdose deaths each year and many, many more overdoses. The toll of substance use disorders on local families, including some of our employees, and as John said his, and on our communities had become too much to accept the status quo. At Cooley, we recognize that we have a unique responsibility to take action. As the healthcare system, our medical providers prescribe narcotics to control pain. And for any of you who've had surgery or broken a leg, you know how important it is to control pain. But we asked ourselves, were we being careful enough? Were we monitoring well enough how many pills we prescribe? Could we do better? And how about treatment, intervention, patient education? How much more could we do? So our, this task force included about 35 staff, physicians, nurses, social workers, public health, an incredible array of staff. We have a lot of committees and task forces at our hospital. And usually to get people, it's kind of begging and cajoling, often food helps, but they still don't really want to come. This task force, we were, people were knocking down the doors. People cared, they were excited that they could do something. A guiding principle in our work has been to recognize that opioid use disorder is a disease and treat it as a disease. Just like diabetes, high blood pressure, when you treat opioid use disorder, the patient improves. And when you take away treatment or deny treatment, the patient gets worse. Our goals were to develop a comprehensive, coordinated approach to reduce opioid utilization, dependence, and overdose. To follow best practices, whether that was from federal, state agencies, and or Partners Healthcare and Mass General, our parent. To very much coordinate with community initiatives. We really believe one plus one can equal three, and we are so pleased that there is a, a, a force like the Hampshire Hope that will bring us together. We also really want to eliminate stigma and replace it with compassionate care and identify at-risk patients anywhere in our system, not just in our emergency department. So we had 15 categories of recommendations from screening to prescribing to the education, treatment, and adding recovery coaches. And many are, have already been put into action and we will continue to do so over the next several months. For example, just recently, 18 providers went through eight hours of training by a Mass General Physician and are now qualified to prescribe buprenorphine, a medication used to assist patients in their recovery. We have an employee who is now available to support the emergency department and other patients as a recovery coach, adding to what the clinical service options already does. Many new screening, prescribing, and intervention procedures are incorporated into our electronic medical record that will go live in October. I'm really grateful to all of the task force members for leading us on this effort, but I'd especially like to thank task force co-chairs, Jeff Harness, Director of Community Health, and Dr. Peter Halpern, Medical Director of Integrated Behavioral Health. So I'd ask them to stand up. So I am proud of our commitment to addressing the crisis and taking proactive steps to be part of the solution. But having great community partners like the Hope Coalition, the City of Northampton, the police, the District Attorney David Sullivan and his staff has made our efforts stronger and better coordinated. I'm grateful for the support of so many in our community. We received grants from the Massachusetts Bankers Association, the Hampshire District Medical Society, and the Massachusetts Medical Society, and more than $7,000 in donations from our own employees. I am especially grateful for the support of Florence Bank. John saw how you heard him. He saw how important this issue is to the community, and the bank stepped up in a big way to help us reach our goals. They've provided the leadership gift to make this initiative possible. Their gift and their leadership is truly extraordinary. Thank you, John. Your support has made an incredible difference to this community. So our opioid projects are, will be funded fully through philanthropy, so we absolutely are still looking for more support and more gifts. To the people here tonight who are in recovery, please know that we stand behind you and we pledge to do our best to support you. To the families here tonight, 
Our thoughts and our hearts are with you every day. And to the health professionals in the room and all the agencies that provide services, we know how challenging this work is and we applaud your efforts toward a safer, healthier community. When a community comes together like this, and I would agree that we can absolutely be a role model for the country, even difficult challenges like opioid epidemic, there is hope. So thank you to John, thank you all of you, and thank you to Terry. So our next two speakers are leaders in the field of behavioral health and addiction. They brought a wealth of passion and expertise to our coalition. Personally, I know that when I'm sitting at the table with them, I feel inspired and I feel grateful to know that they are out there paving, for, paving the way for the way that we approach addiction and recovery. So we'll first hear a few short remarks from Dr. Peter Halperin, who is the Medical Director of Integrated Behavioral Health at Cooley Dickinson Healthcare. And then we'll have a few remarks from Ed Schreiber, who is the Director of Outpatient Substance Use Services at ServiceNet, and he's an author, a researcher, and a trainer in addiction treatment. Thank you, Sherry. It's uh, really an honor to be here tonight and uh, amongst all of you. <clears throat> and I do want to uh, call out Sherry yet again for the tremendous work she and her organization are doing. I want to call out John and, and his bank for hopefully kick-starting um, what other members of our community will uh, be motivated to uh, uh, participate in. Um, the opportunity is uh, tremendous to do a lot of good by following this example. And I am essentially representing the task force and uh, co-chaired it with Jeff. But I guess what I want to use my small amount of time that I want to take is I want to sit down and listen to our, uh, our um, expert speakers. I, I decided to, um, in some ways similar to Sherry, to come up with a, a way of bringing this into the human being. Um, uh, but also kind of talk about the broad implications. And I'm going to use fentanyl as the uh, gateway to this little discussion. Now, I'm a physician and, uh, and a psychiatrist and certainly aware and appreciate the incredible myriad of psychosocial factors that um, all intertwine in substance disorder. Um, but at its most basic level, the effect of these drugs on the brain um, are so powerful that I think it's important to kind of uh, paint a picture of it. So fentanyl, for those folks who may not be aware, is a synthetic opioid that is in the order of hundreds to thousands times more potent than heroin or oxycodone. Hundreds to thousands of times. So I'm going to talk about briefly the meta and then the personal. Imagine we became aware that in the mail there were packages being sent and these packages contained a powder and a not too big package could kill a million people kill a million people what image comes to mind anthrax terrorism a horrible devastating fearful event which thank goodness has not occurred but this is occurring every day. I don't know if folks happen to have seen an article in the New York Times recently about the black market, web-based distribution of fentanyl, mostly coming from overseas, but to neighbors anywhere um, that then get distributed. And the amount that comes in a package can kill hundreds of thousands to a million people. So something has got to be done. When we talk about harm reduction, the harm quotient has become exponentially increased. Heroin and, and, and the uh, prescription painkillers are bad enough, okay? Now we have substances that are freely available that this much could kill you. Now I'm gonna bring it to a personal. Why in the world would anybody ingest in any form any amount of a drug that has such lethal potency. And here I think it's important to maybe put it into a vignette. 22 year old young boy, still call him a boy, a patient, thankfully, thankfully alive and well, I was seeing some months ago, maybe more like a year now, telling the following story in a group that I was running. 
he and a couple of his friends get some stuff, unbelievably potent stuff. One of his friends immediately ODs. He brings him to the emergency room, this is in Greenfield, watches as they resuscitate him. He was on the edge of death. What did this young man then do? He went back to do it himself. Because these drugs are so unbelievably reinforcing, they're so powerfully intoxicating that you're dealing with it came from outer space monster. It can't be underestimated. There is a reason that human beings do this despite all the rational reason not to. We have to do something. We have to, as a society, somehow clamp down on the fentanyl and the even newer fentanyl derivatives that are, by the way, now becoming tens of thousands of times more potent. And we have to realize the unbelievable dilemma that each human being faces if they're already being exposed to this kind of uh, problem and what it takes to stop. And it takes more than what we're doing, that's for sure. Every year, the death rate goes up. Last year, nationally, death rate went up a lot. These drugs are the leading killer of human beings in the United States under the age of 50. The leading killer. If this was any other kind of death march, whether it was political or terroristic or some other plague, it would be getting a lot more attention than it's getting. But it's attached to the decades of stigmatism and, and, and ignorance and, uh, and repression. We've got to help folks. And you know, harm reduction, in fact, is probably one of the ways to do so. Um, but all of us need to step up. And in an age where finances in healthcare settings are so tight, the work that's involved does not generate much funds, philanthropy, and, and mutual support is the way. So if there's anybody here that can jump on John's bandwagon, it's definitely time to do it. Thank you. I brought water up because I can get pretty hot around this topic, so I need to cool myself down a little bit. Um, so yeah, so I am the director of substance abuse services at ServiceNet Outpatient, but that's not the story. I was um, sent to a rehab when I was in my early 20s. I spent a year in treatment. I needed every day of that, without exception, to get sober. Um, so I'm a person in long-term recovery. So I, I want to talk not about me, but about the moment in which we're living from a different perspective. We are the best thought leaders in the world are saying loud and clear that we are in the beginning or the middle of a paradigm shift in understanding addiction. And I want to speak about that. What is a paradigm shift? I'd like to talk about four of them and tell you what the paradigm shift we're in is. So one paradigm shift is the earth is flat. People believed that. That's the way people understood and thought about reality and then it changed to the earth is round. Paradigm shift, change in consciousness. Or a paradigm shift of everything revolves around me the ego, or everything revolves around us, the cultural ego, to a paradigm shift based on quantum physics that we're ultimately all related. We're all expressions of one life force in different forms. Paradigm shift. Here's another paradigm shift. It's the addicts on the street in Main Street with needles out of their arms, the problem, to Addiction is a part of the human experience and we're all on the spectrum in some form. Whether it to be shopping or work, whatever stimulates the production of neurochemicals from outside in is potentially addictive. Or here's another paradigm shift. After 241 years as a country, a woman got the most votes for president.
what are, we, what are we talking about in terms of a paradigm shift in understanding addiction? So one of the first steps is to change the question from why the addiction to why the pain? Because people are using substances to, to reduce pain. There's understanding about what happens to the brain that doesn't allow it to produce sufficient neurochemicals so that they have to be gotten from the outside. That's the beginning of a new paradigm shift. I want to read something, a paragraph or two from a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. And this is amazing. This is where we're going. This is the moment that we're standing on and what we're facing. Then I want to talk about your city, our city, and what we can do. So this is by Norman Deutsch. He's a leader in a form of understanding the brain called neuroplasticity, which says essentially the brain is plastic. It grows. It develops. It's like what you said. These drugs impact the structure of the brain, not only our thinking and feeling, but the brain itself. So here's what he says. He says, in the course of my travels, this guy interviewed leading scientists around the world. In the course of my travels, I met a scientist who enabled people who had been blind since birth to begin to see. Another who enabled the deaf to hear. I spoke with people who had strokes decades before and who had been declared incurable, but who were helped into recovery with neuroplastic treatments. Neuroplastic treatments are a way of understanding how to stimulate the brain's production of those chemicals we need to feel connected and alive. I met people whose learning disabilities were cured with those and whose IQs were raised. I saw people rewrite their brains with their thoughts, their connections to others, to cure previously incurable obsessions and trauma. I spoke with Nobel laureates who were hotly debating how we must rethink our model of how of the brain now that we know that it's an ever-changing organism. The idea that the brain can change its own structure and its own function through thought and activity is, I believe, the most important alteration to our view of the brain since we first, way back when, sketched its basic anatomy and workings of its basic component, which is the neuron. Like all revolutions, this one will have profound effects. The neuroplastic revolution has implications for our understanding of how love, grief, sex, relationship, learning, and addictions. Culture, technology, psychotherapies can change the brain. All of the humanities, social sciences, and physical sciences, insofar as they deal with human nature, will all be affected by this new emerging paradigm. All these disciplines will have to come to terms with the fact that the self-changing brain is now a scientific fact. And the realization of the architecture of the brain will differ from one person to another. That's where we're going. It's an idea. It's an idea rooted in successful treatment with people who have chronic pain, for people who have lost limbs after wars, with pain that never stops, with people who have had strokes, in rewiring the brain circuitry to produce the chemicals that we need. If that can be done for those conditions, there's no doubt in my mind that we can also learn how to do this with addictive disorders. We're lucky living in Northampton because we have Smith, Amherst College, UMass, Holyoke, and Hampshire College. The chair of the neuroscience department is coupling with me and a client of mine to study how we can develop education and training for staff and for clients about how to stimulate brain function. We are poised, Northampton, the Pioneer Valley, in my opinion, can't, we are poised to lead this. And why? Because it's who we are as a progressive community of people. And all of the other activities will continue, but if we can uptick our understanding of the brain and addiction, but not just that, the brain and recovery. We understand about the brain and drugs and the brain and addiction, 
but we're at the precipice of understanding about the brain and recovery. If we can teach Harrison House staff and clients how to facilitate that through relationships, through connections, we're going to be providing a kind of treatment that may have impact, I believe. And I'm committed to this at 100%. Why I know this is absolutely true is because when I entered this treatment program, I had nothing, not even despair. And yet, through connections and relationships and commitment, my loss of hope was regained but it was the reconnection of my brain, it was that rewiring of the brain that the two founders of AA knew was the source of, the source of their treatment. You know, 90 meetings in 90 days. So people are using drugs because people are in pain. The pain can be rooted from childhood, from trauma, from stress, and it can be rooted in the culture in which we're living, the hopelessness of our culture right now. And all of those things are real, and yet we can't stop there. We have to move the science of recovery related in brain science forward. That's the challenge, and that's the opportunity. And not as a top-down or, you know, organizational structure where thought leaders know and clients don't, not, not that, but horizontal, doing this together. So way back there, in one of those tables, I'm going to be sitting after this, and I have my business card at ServiceNet. And if you're interested in stepping the treatment model forward based upon not evidence-based treatment alone, but on brain science, and understanding that this is a common condition, be it a, a civilization addicted to oil or a person addicted to heroin. It's the same spectrum. It's the same problem. We're in it together. We're all connected. They are us. They're a mirror to us. We are them. we have two newly developing recovery centers that are working on fostering those connections and they need your support. We have um, the Nest out in Belshire Town and you can learn more about that at the SOAR table and we have the Northampton Recovery Center and we need more. Um, and these are, this is where we need to be putting our effort so thank you Ed very much for that. Um, so please show your support to the recovery centers. Okay, so finally, and with great, great honor, I am here to welcome Michael Botticelli in front of us tonight. So Mr. Botticelli is the Executive Director of the Graken Center for Addiction Medicine at Boston Medical Center and a distinguished policy scholar at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Prior to this, Michael was the Director of the National Drug Control Policy under the Obama Administration. He joined the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy as Deputy Director in November of 2012, and then later served as the Acting Director. In this role, he led the Obama administration's drug policy efforts, which were based on a balanced public health and public safety approach. The administration advanced historic drug policy reforms and innovations in prevention, criminal justice, treatment, and recovery. Mr. Botticelli has more than two decades of experience supporting Americans affected by substance use disorder. Prior to joining the Office of National Drug Control Policy, he served as the director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services here in Massachusetts. And I just want to put a little note, they're actually changing their name to the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services. Um, so that's just important for folks to know, because language matters, right? Um, and here he was successful in expanding innovation and nationally recognized prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery services here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He also forged strong partnerships with local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies, human service agencies, and stakeholder groups to guide and implement these evidence-based programs. He holds a bachelor's degree from Siena College and a master's of education 
from St. Lawrence University. And he's also in long-term recovery from a substance use disorder, celebrating more than 28 years. We are so thankful to have you here, and we would love to welcome you to the podium. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Jerry, thank you for that introduction and for your speech. Um, I was getting a little uh, emotional when she was introducing me, and part of this is, um, you know, things go first full circle in life. I started working, um, well, first of all, let me um, just say a couple uh, words of thanks. So uh, the mayor had to leave, but thank you to the mayor. Uh, thank you to other elected officials who are here today. Uh, John, Monica, Joanne, thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. D.A. Sullivan, uh, for your um, spearheading efforts around criminal justice reform uh, is uh, incredibly important uh, work to other folks. Jeff, thank you for the, uh, for the invitation to be here. It's a really special place uh, for me. Um, I also want to give a particular shout out to my former staff at uh, BSAS uh, who are here, Erica Piedad and Ruth Jacobson Hardy, who I think you know are incredible. Um, I, I, I will tell you that you probably you, you will never have a better advocate for services here in Western Massachusetts than Ruth Jacobs and Hardy. And I remember um, <laughs> you know we were fortunate when we were at the bureau because we actually did get significant new dollars to help in this. And you know Ruth would be there all the time talking about where is a fair share for Western Massachusetts and that Massachusetts doesn't end at Springfield. Um, so it's really important and to other folks, Deb Berkowitz, who I've known for a very long time. So I just want to thank you uh, for the work that you're doing. But, but it is pretty significant for me to be here. I was thinking, um, I spent, uh, I thought I was going to work for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health for maybe a year or two. Uh, and I ended up staying there almost 18 years. And my first job at BSAS, uh, I was a program manager and I was the HIV coordinator. Um, and uh, BSAS um, had uh, some federal dollars to provide uh, HIV uh, outreach services, Annie's here, she probably remembers this, uh, provide um, uh, outreach services to out of treatment injection drug users as a way to get them into care and Tapestry Health Systems had the contract and Tim Purrington was the contract manager. I don't think I ever heard their words harm reduction before I met Tim. Uh, so, um, so it's a really special place for me, so I spend a lot of my early time out here uh, and throughout the course of my time at DPH. So it really feels special for me to be, as I've come back to Massachusetts, to uh, uh, come to uh, Northampton and Western Mass again. So um, I, what, what I thought I'd do is just spend a, a little bit of time uh, kind of talking about um, the, what we tried to accomplish with the Obama administration. I think some of the challenges uh, that we're presented with right now and, and I think um, where, where we need to go next with this issue. Um, so, so one is, and uh, John talked about a paradigm shift, and you know, w one of the things that we really tried to do with drug policy um, at, with the Obama administration is, is really shift our approach to one based on arrest and incarceration uh, and supply reduction to one that was based on public health. Our office was actually started in 1988 um, and really tasked with formulating the administration's drug policy, but we also had a really unique function in that we looked at the, what each agency was spending and tasked each agency spending around how we were going to approach issues of drug use. And throughout the history of our office, those supply reduction strategies, you know, eradicating heroin in Mexico, and I'm not saying these are not important, but the overwhelming dollars that the federal government spent were always tilted uh, toward uh, 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 eradication interdiction efforts. And very little, quite honestly, was spent on uh, public health funds, prevention, treatment, recovery support. And, you know, and I have to say things have changed uh, under President Trump's new budget. But when we left the administration, it was the first time in the history of our office that we were actually spending equal amounts on both supply reduction and public health strategies. And I think that's really important. <laughs> And, and I also think we were able to make significant progress around criminal justice reform, both at the national level, state, and local level. Um, but, but I want to talk about our approach to this epidemic. Um, many of those things talked about here, and then uh, I'd also like to kind of open it up to kind of questions and comments. 
So, so first and foremost, you know, we know prevention is the key. And I think that, uh, you know, both in terms of this epidemic and substance use uh, issues in general, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we have vibrant community-based prevention programs. You know, a former speaker of the House of Massachusetts used to talk about all politics is local. And I always used to say that all prevention is local. So what th issues look like here in Northampton is different from what it looks like in Worcester and Boston. And so part of our efforts were to continue to support. And, and I think uh, many of you are here uh, that are, have been recipients of drug-free community grant programs through our office. And uh, we're actually glad um, that President Trump decided uh, not to eliminate those grants um, and uh, uh, understood the value of those dollars. But particularly in the opiate epidemic, we knew that we had a, a, a significant overprescribing issue. And Joanne, I really want to thank you for your efforts. We're doing the same thing at Boston Medical Center. Um, and, and part of this is, you know, and I think you've seen data that, uh, you know, we, we are prescribing enough pain medication to give every adult American their own bottle of pain pills. Right? And so, you know, yes, we want pain treated. Sometimes they don't need to be treated with an opioid. Uh, sometimes we have things like physical therapy and acupuncture and massage that will do quite well. Uh, you know, we were talking about surgery. I saw a study out of Dartmouth-Hitchcock that looked at the top five outpatient surgeries and uh, where people got prescription for opioids. And what they found is that, quite honestly, uh, when they went back and they polled people about how much they took, they found out that the vast majority of them uh, took one or two or three days worth of prescriptions, right? And so you know what happens uh, after that. We, as uh, good consumers of healthcare, you know, uh, we take our prescriptions, things that we don't use, and we stick them in a medicine cabinet for a rainy day, and we know that that's uh, where it gets diverted. So part of what we did, we worked with the DEA, and I know many of you did this at the local level, of sponsoring drug take back days. Uh, and that's been wildly successful in terms of both educating the community around prescription drugs, but also promoting safe and effective storage and disposal uh, uh, opportunities. We worked with the DEA to establish new regulations so that you wouldn't have to wait until drug take back days. And I think many of you have been partnering with local pharmacies and others to s establish uh, uh, kiosks uh, within pharmacies to be able to give them back uh, on, on a daily basis. So, but fundamentally, we really focused on treatment. So, you know, we were talking about other diseases. So here in the United States, um, uh, only about 10 to 14 percent of people who reach diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder get treatment. Think about that, 14 percent. So substance use disorders has roughly the same prevalence as diabetes, right? Um, but about 85 percent of people with diabetes are getting treatment. And why? Why is that? Well, one, we're doing a good job at early intervention. Right? So at every step along the way, particularly if you have a family history of diabetes, we're doing a better job at detection and monitoring and intervening people before they reach their acute stage. We don't do that with addiction. So um, you know, part of what we try to promote is better screening and brief intervention for those folks. But really fundamentally expanding treatment. And I have to say, and I think you know, here's where we have, are very fortunate to uh, be in Massachusetts. Um, where we have had pretty significant health care coverage, where our Medicaid program has been very generous in terms of, but that's not the case uh, around the country. And, you know, one of the things that was particularly important is the role that the Affordable Care Act played in expanding coverage to people around the country. Um, by one, providing them comprehensive coverage, ensuring that there was a substance use disorder treatment benefit and Medicaid expansion plans, um, but also ensuring that those were offered on par with other health conditions uh, by making sure that insurance companies, both public and private, met parity. So in the United States now, we have what I call treatment deserts. We have 40% of counties in the United States that don't have an, an outpatient program that takes Medicaid. We know, quite honestly, that we don't have enough buprenorphine trained doctors. So of the 900,000 physicians in the United States, only a little over 30,000 have been wavered to treat people with buprenorphine. And we know that even a lower number than that actually prescribe, and of those that prescribe, they're prescribing in very, very low numbers. So, so one of the things that we did is work with Congress to allow nurse practitioners and physician assistants to be able to prescribe buprenorphine. We worked to integrate buprenorphine and medication-assisted treatment into community health centers around the country, something that's already happened here in Massachusetts. We put out $100 million in grants to community health centers to be able to do that. Um, we also worked with the American Medical Association and others to, for their commitment 
to uh, uh, train an additional 60,000 physicians over the next five years to be able to uh, uh, administer uh, buprenorphine. So, you know, we know we have a long way to go. Um, but, you know, I, I want to talk about a, a couple things. And, you know, I've been in recovery, and, you know, one of the things that I think is particularly challenging is the way that we view medication assisted treatment. Um, and for too long, um, I think we've heard this divisiveness around medication assisted treatment. Some of it coming from the recovery community themselves, that people who are on these medications who are not in recovery. And, the, you know, part of the evidence is clear. Like, you know, we learned a long time ago that the world was not flat, right? And we changed our opinion. And it's time to change our opinion. All the evidence is clear that people on medication-assisted treatment, when they get support in the community, behavioral health supports, do better than treatment without, right? So one of the things, Eric is here, we actually changed our licensing regulations to say if you're a treatment program in Massachusetts, you cannot deny people access to medication-assisted treatment. Right? So it's really important to do that. We change language at the federal level to say if you are a drug court and you get federal money, you cannot kick people off of medication and you can't deny, you can't predicate their participation in drug courts on, if people are on medication. So it's time for the divisiveness to end. The evidence is really clear. So the other piece, and again, you know, I come back to um, uh, uh, Western Massachusetts in terms of the work that we're doing is um, pr promoting people in recovery. And I think, you know, all of you know, uh, and I've been pretty public about my own recovery, um, but I, I'm one of an estimated 20 million people in the United States who are in recovery. And quite honestly, for too long, we've been too silent. Um, we've been, you know, um, you know we've, we felt the shame and the stigma attached to it and been afraid to come out. Sometimes we've been members of 12-step programs and, and we've confused anonymity with uh, being an advocate. And so, just so you know, the, the founders of AA were the biggest champions and biggest vocal proponents of recovery. So anonymity and recovery and advocacy go hand in hand and it's part of the foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step groups. So, but, but it really is important that we have a vibrant and vocal recovery community for one, a couple of reasons, you know, and this is where Sherry started out. It's about hope, right? And fundamentally, we can have all the treatment capacity that we want, but if people don't see the hope on the other side of addiction, then it's not going to make a difference. You know, I, I remember very distinctly, you know, when I knew that I had a problem, but I was too afraid to ask for help. I was really afraid what people were going to think of me. You know I, I, you know, I felt like I looked pretty good. You know, I had a professional job. And I was really concerned with what my employers were going to think, what my family was going to think. And that keeps so many people from asking for help. So you know, a couple things that I think are, are, are really important as we think about how we're going to change that and how we're going to really deal with stigma and, and make, this, uh, make this an issue that uh, uh, people are not ashamed to talk about. Uh, and one, um, and I've met a couple folks here, one is I think that we have seen this tremendous amount of energy with the recovery community and particularly pe young people in recovery who I can't thank enough for your willingness to establish chapters all across the country. We now have recovery support centers. You know, I love driving down the street and seeing a recovery support center next to every other business that we have here. You know, uh, I, I, I won't tell you the town, but a town not too far from here um, uh, um, tried to block um, every single treatment program, recovery support program that we wanted to give them, despite the fact that they were one of the most impacted cities in Massachusetts. And, you know, and here's, you know, science and data don't, don't drive public policy. People drive public policy, and that's why we need to be vocal. That's why we need to be uh, um, uh, out there and, uh, and advocate. Uh, many of you I know have for a long time actually worked uh, uh, around issues of HIV and AIDS. Um, and it, it wasn't just this wonderful community that decided, oh, you know, gay men and injection drug users and Haitians have HIV, and so we're going to, you know, do everything that we can. That's not how it happened. It was because a lot of gay men and lesbians got really angry and demanded change. You know, and, and I go back to the fact that if this were any other disease, a half a million people have died of drug overdoses since 2000. Think of that. Half a million people. And you mean to tell me if this affected any other people? 
um, that, that we would have seen tremendous amount of action uh, a, a long, long time ago. Um, and, and one of the things that, that uh, you know, I think is uh, tremendously important. So one, we need a really uh, vocal and active recovery community. That um, in these days where science and data don't uh, appear uh, to be winning the day, think climate change, think immunizations, um, people change. People change opinions when they know someone else. And part of what we need to do is make sure uh, that those of us in recovery, those that have been impacted by us, are doing everything we can uh, to make this uh, a visible issue, to give hope to other people, to see that recovery is possible, to see that you can have a, a vibrant place in the community. You know, you know, I, I've often said, if you asked me 28 years ago, I would end up working in, in the White House as President Obama's drug policy advisor. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Um, but, but my story is not unique. You know, I'm one of millions and millions of people who've been restored to productive lives in our community and have used that to give back. Um, but, the, but the other piece I want to talk about, I do, I do want to talk about language um, because it's one of the simplest things that we can do to affect change. So. Uh, um, uh, Dr. John Kelly, who many of you know works at uh, MGH, uh, runs the Recovery Research Institute, did a really interesting study where he gave two trained, cl trained clinicians, so we're not talking about people on the street, uh, the same uh, scenario. And in one scenario, he talked about a person with a substance use disorder. And in the other one, the only thing he changed was a, a substance abuser. And what he found is even among trained clinicians, when you talk to, to someone as a substance abuser, it was more likely to elicit a punitive response. Um, as opposed to a therapeutic response. And, and I hear the words that people use all the time. I see what's written in the press when people say junkie and addict. You know, people hear those words. And not only does it keep people from asking for help, but it has a direct impact on how we think about public policy. Johns Hopkins did a study about the stigma of addiction. They found that because of what people think about people with substance use disorders, 44% of Americans didn't, felt like people with substance use disorders were not worthy of a treatment benefit, right? So, you know, and, and if anything kind of shocked me when uh, I came back to Boston, I like we're thinking uh, progress. Many of you know Boston Medical Center uh, sits um, uh, at a really interesting intersection in Boston. Uh, it used to be no one went there, and now it's become incredibly gentrified. Um, and as you can imagine, it set off lots of community issues around those people. Um, and I was coming from a meeting, and I was crossing Mass Ave and Albany Street. And we have not only Boston Medical Center, but Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And I was crossing the street. It was a night like tonight. Uh, and a truck goes by, and the windows are down. And I hear a guy say to the other guy who's riding in the car, we should just line them up and shoot them. And I thought, you know, how, uh, you know, we think we've come far because who we're here, but, but we haven't. We have a really long way to go. So, uh, I, and, but I'm very happy to say um, that the AP style book, which is the journalist handbook of how they talk about things, actually just came out with new language around addiction, right? And it said, don't use words like drunk, uh, uh, drunk and junkie and addict. Um, use words like person with a substance use disorder and addiction. And for those of us in the recovery community, we have a particular challenge. And I always say, don't use your 12-step voice in public settings, right? And so what we call each other in private and in meetings is not the language that we use in public, right? So, you know, if we're on the street, you want to call me a drunk, you're more than happy to do that. But we don't use that language on the outside because it influences how people think about us. So, um, but, but the last thing I'll say, and then we can talk about this, and this has been the theme of the night. Many of you have probably read a book called Dreamland, right? How many people have read Dreamland? Uh, it was written by an author called Sam Quinones, who I've gotten the pleasure to, to um, uh, meet. And it's really about the opioid uh, epidemic. And just the short version, Dreamland was this park and pool complex in Portsmouth, Ohio. And Ohio has been really hard hit, right? And you grew up in Dreamland. You went, they had three pools, and as you got older, you went from one pool to another. You know, and that's where you hang up. That's where families had picnics. You know, and he talks about um, how all of that is gone now. And, and I've heard him speak, and I've had the opportunity to talk, uh, uh, to be uh, um, uh, at conferences where he has spoken. And he uses a phrase that I have often repeated and has been the theme for tonight. And he said, the fundamental solution to our heroin epidemic is community. 
And I really believe that. I actually believe it's how we work with each other in community. You know, there's been a lot that's written that have been written about, you know, the impact in communities where people haven't gotten jobs. And, and certainly we know the role that poverty uh, plays as it relates to addiction. But it's not just about jobs. Jobs give people purpose and meaning in their lives. You know, it's about how they connect with their neighbors, how they connect with their institutions, uh, with their faith institutions. It's how they connect with each other. So, so one of the things I've always liked about this community is um, the, the level, I've always said, Ruth has heard me say this many, many times, everybody knows people here. Everybody knows each other. The relationships that you have here are unique. And that's your strength, that's your re resilience, and that's what you can uh, continue to, to build from. Um, and the other thing that I, I just want to say is that we have some law enforcement folks here uh, who are here today. Um, and, and I've said this many, many times, that um, the way that our federal, state, local law enforcement, our DAs and our criminal justice system have leaned into this issue and have partnered with us on the public health side for comprehensive solutions uh, can't be um, uh, appreciated more. Um, so, you know, and, and all of that started here in Massachusetts. Right? Think about that. Um, you know, the first police force in the country to do naloxone was Quincy, Massachusetts. Now, thousands of police forces are using it. I think many of you know the Police Assisted Recovery Initiative started in Gloucester, right, where police have said, um, you know, we'll come in to treatment, um, come into the police station, we'll give you treatment. Diversion programs that the DA has supported here started here in Massachusetts. So, you know, we have a very, very long history. And, and I do think that, quite honestly, and I've said this before, that if we can't get it right in Massachusetts, nobody's going to get it right. Because we have the best thinkers, we have the most commitment, we have the most resources, we have great community partners to do this. So, I, you know, I, I, I want to thank you all for the work that you do. Um, you know, when, when I was at the White House, I had to be very careful because I represented the country. And I represented some places in the country that were not as liberal as Massachusetts, if you can believe that. <laughs> so I had to be very, very careful about how many times I promoted things that were happening here in Massachusetts. But, but time and time again throughout the course of this epidemic, when we were struggling with issues or we wanted to promote innovative programs or we wanted to promote our communities, we kept coming back to the work that was happening here. Um, and so I, I feel very kind of proud and honored to be able to come back to Massachusetts because I, I, I do think, and I'm very, not to be political, I am very, very concerned about the direction that this um, uh, administration is taking as it relates to opiate addiction. So when, we, when you talk about uh, basically um, kicking uh, uh, tens of millions of people off insurance, when you're talking about allowing states to not, not to have to mandate a substance use disorder treatment. When you talk about going back to tough on crime, I, I really worry that, that uh, we are not going to see the support from the federal government that we did in previous administrations. So, so I think it's really incumbent on us on the state and local level to keep this momentum going, to continue to make progress. Uh, while, while we've come very far, all you have to do is to look at the number of deaths that we have here. Uh, in Massachusetts, and I think you all know, you know, the role that fentanyl has played. So, you know, if anything kind of talks about the partnership with our, our criminal justice partners is the fentanyl issue about how do we get this out of our uh, supply, how do we get it out of our communities, how do we make sure that we are getting good uh, um, uh, information out to our people who are using uh, who are still using to make sure that they understand that they uh, shouldn't use, uh, they shouldn't use alone always use in the presence of someone who's got naloxone, go slow. Um, I also think, you know, we need to continue to think about innovative approaches, and I know many parts of the state in this country are talking about safe consumption sites, right? And fundamentally, I go back to what Sherry said about, you know, uh, do we value someone's life? And, and, and quite honestly, if saving someone's life uh, is not a noble goal uh, for uh, those programs, then uh, um, you know, but our challenge is they are uh, still against both state law and federal law, and even if we change state law, I'm worried what the federal government's going to do uh, in these kinds of situations. But we need to continue to innovate. We need to continue to do more. We need to continue to come together uh, as a community. Everybody has a role to play, you know, and I think we've seen great support from our banks, from our DA, from our hospital systems. Uh, you know, all of us have a role to play. 
uh, in this epidemic. So um, I'm really uh, happy to be here. It's nice to be in Northampton again. Um, I hope to uh, continue to be back. Um, we're, we'll continue to work together. The uh, Great Kent Center, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is a um, new center for addiction uh, at Boston Medical Center, uh, started by an uh, incredibly generous donation from uh, a family who's been affected by this issue. So donated $25 million, the biggest, um, the biggest gift in the hospital's history. Uh, and it's great to see philanthropy finally acknowledging uh, uh, that we need help, that uh, federal government and state government can't do it in, alone, that we need those community partners to do it. So I'm not asking you to donate to Great Kent Center because other folks have already put out that call. So I don't want to take resources away from Northampton and Western Massachusetts. But, but it's really been my uh, honor um, to um, represent you um, nationally and internationally. Um, but also to come back here because I think there is no better place and there are no better people doing this work than the people in this room and the people around the state. So thank you very much.